Hi, my name is Laura, and welcome to my podcast, Why the Book Wins, where I compare books with their movie adaptations, and through these discussions, you will hear why, nine times out of ten, the book wins. I'll also share different behind-the-scenes trivia I've discovered in my research, which by learning makes the story all the more interesting. If you love either books, movies, or both, this is the perfect podcast for you. This probably already goes without saying, but there will be spoilers for both the book and the movie in this podcast. So if you plan on reading the book or watching the movie, go do that first and then come back and listen to this. And now without further ado, let's get right into it. Welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for listening today. We are talking about the book, The Dark Fields, written by Alan Glynn, published in 2001. Then it was turned into a movie under the name Limitless, directed by Neil Berger, released in 2011. So Limitless is a movie I've seen multiple times, so I went into this book with a pretty clear memory of what happens. Initially, the movie does follow the book pretty close, and when I was part th- part way through, I was looking it up on Goodreads, and a reviewer made a comment about the book and movie saying, there's a reason why the book is called Dark Fields, and the movie is Limitless. And so this comment helped me be more curious and to keep reading, Because there were times when I felt like the book moved a bit slow, but I was anxious to see how it ends because clearly it won't be the same as the movie based on that comment. Before I get into the changes, here is a quick synopsis. So Eddie is basically living a dead-end life, and then one day he runs into his ex-brother-in-law, who used to be his coke dealer. He is now dealing a new drug, which he says is FDA-approved and legal, and it's called MDT. Eddie takes it, and it's kind of like Adderall, I guess, but even better because he not only is able to focus on something until it's finished, but he can also comprehend things that would have been unfathomable before. And he can read at a lightning pace, and he comprehends everything he reads. And when he's on it, he just always has to be focusing on something and working his brain in some way. And so he goes back to buy more, but his brother-in-law has been killed, and his place has been ransacked. And the people, like, trashed his place because they were looking for MDT, the drugs, and they didn't find it. However, Eddie... He quickly searches and he does find it. So now he has like 500 pills or so. And so he gets to a point where he's popping two at a time and is constantly on it. And then he starts having blackouts. And so this worries him. And so then he stops taking the MDT. But then he later finds out that if he combines MDT with this allergy medication, it balances out and he no longer has the blackouts. And so then he starts taking three at a time. And he's working his way very quickly to the top of the business world as he spearheads this major merger that will make him $50 million. However, in the end, the pills are stolen from him by the same people who stole them from the dealer who were trying to steal them from his ex-brother-in-law. And he thinks he might have killed someone while he was blacked out. And then near the end, he does kill this Russian crime boss guy who is also on MDT. And I'm going to stop there before totally explaining the ending. Because like I said, the book ending is different than the movie, so I will hold off on revealing that. And so my thoughts on the book, there were times where I felt like the book dragged a bit, especially when talking about stocks, the stock market and things like that. Like I get he's become some kind of stock whiz, but I personally have no interest in knowing the details and how that's done. And when he short sells in the day trading office, that's fine, because that makes more sense to explain it. But the other parts were just so bleh. Like reading stuff like that just puts me to sleep. And there's another part, like I said, where he stops taking the MDT, but then he gets on it again. And as he re-experiences everything, it just felt like deja vu. Like the author is just explaining all the same things again. Like, yeah, I get it. We, You already told us how different it is when he's on the MDT. You don't need to explain how he cleaned his apartment all over again. And then there were also a lot of names to keep track of. And in my opinion, if it's not an integral character, then we don't even need to know their name. And so he's just tossing too many names out there. And as the reader, you don't know which ones you need to remember because he doesn't explain like, this is a really important character. Remember their name. He doesn't say that. He's just tossing out these names. And so I'm trying to remember all of them because I don't know which ones are important. And then it just makes me confused. (laughs) And then he'll... I'll just be like, wait, like, who is this person? Who does he work for? I don't even remember now. It wasn't terrible, but it was just a few names too many. And having said all that, it was a really interesting book, and it was well written for the most part. And you really feel the anxiety and the energy and the urgency, the panics, the excitement, the highs and the lows Eddie feels at various points in the story. Even though at times he went into too much detail, which I found boring, as I said, 
there were other times where he knew he didn't just need to describe things step by step and he just did a broad stroke explaining something which i liked overall the movie is really well done especially the camera angles used throughout and the way the color is very faded and drab when he's sober and then when he's on mdt everything is bright and clear leslie dixon is the screenwriter who adapted the novel and she sold it under the condition that no changes be made to it and watching this i would have bet money that there had been an alternate ending but this makes it seem like leslie dixon wrote this ending and no other endings were an option so i guess there isn't an alternate ending um but the voiceover the narration is really is done really well too and it fits the the vibe of the book narration so with acting we have bradley cooper who is amazing as eddie he plays both the dead end eddie and the overachieving quick talking eddie excellently especially when he's doing that rapid fire talk and his character is so cocky so that does get annoying but i'm assuming as the audience we're supposed to find him annoying at times and this role was actually originally going to go to shia labeouf but he injured his hand and he had to drop out and i think he would have been really good too so it really is a win-win regardless of who they had in it we have abby cornish who is in the role of eddie's girlfriend lindy and she does a good job Robert De Niro is, of course, wonderful as the business tycoon Carl Van Loon. And then Anna Friel plays Eddie's ex-wife, Melissa. She isn't in much, but I love Friel. I think she is an amazing actress, and she's great in this. To start out, the book calls the pills MDT, but the movie calls it NZT. And so just to keep things simple, I am only going to refer to them as MDT. And in each, Eddie starts having blackouts, which gets worse and worse. And he tries to get off it to stop the blackouts, which he does in the movie too. But in both things aren't going so well. And in the book, he was chubby originally, but he rapidly loses weight when he's on MDT. And then when he's off it, he gains weight back quickly again. So it's an even more drastic difference in his looks. Anyway, so he finds a guy who had gotten off MDT. And this guy tells him that when he had told Vernon he was quitting... Vernon told the guy that they had figured out the blackouts and you just had to combine it with these over-the-counter allergy meds and they counteract each other and stop the blackouts. So by taking that medicine and remembering to eat, you'll be fine. Whereas in the movie, he solves the blackout blackout problem simply by remembering to eat and not drinking. And there's a quote from this book I found interesting, which I thought rang true. So he's looking through Vernon's notebook and he's realizing that these people are all clients using MDT. And he says... The realization that these people had all used MDT at one time or another and were maybe still using it came as quite a shock to me. It also bruised my ego a little, because although it was clearly irrational to think that no one besides myself had ever experienced the amazing effects of MDT, I nevertheless felt that my experience of it was in some way unique and more authentic than that of anyone else who might have tried it. This slightly indignant sense of ownership lingered in my mind as I read the names in the notebook one more time. So having some intense, crazy, potentially life-changing moment, specifically with some kind of substance, it can be weird to think that others have had the same experience before if they've done the substance. And so then your pride kicks in thinking that maybe, you know, others have experienced it, but I'm different and having an extra special experience when really, like, no, like the high of the drug wants you to feel special, but... Really, your experience is no different than anyone else's. And the movie shows how he was so charismatic when he was on MDT and just the exciting people he meets and traveling and all that. And the book definitely does show this. And it says how he notices how particular people, including Carl Van Loon, will like hang on his every word and they don't want the conversation to end. But he also talks other times where he's like too abrasive and just too much. There's a, he has like a, a vague memory of punching a guy in a bar but he can't remember why he had punched him and he also says he was a difficult customer at restaurants because he would be making all these inquiries about the food and requesting these custom dishes and drinks and then there's a part where he may have hit a woman and killed her hit her in the head and the movie doesn't seem to show this side aside from the potential murder but the movie also just kind of glosses over that so i think they made mdt seem a bit more glamorous And so with character changes, in the movie, Eddie has a girlfriend, Lindy, who we see him get dumped by, though she is very nice about it. In the book, he references a girl who dumps him, but he doesn't try to get her back the way he does in the book, or sorry, the way he does in the movie. So even when he is on MDT, the book just focuses more on Melissa. 
And they also have this other girl in the book, Ginny Van Loon, who is Carl Van Loon's daughter. And nothing happens between her and Eddie, but he does have a crush on her because she reminds him of what Melissa had been like back, you know, 10 years ago. And in the book, when he finds Vernon dead, he calls Melissa and he leaves her a message telling her. She calls later and asks if Vernon had given him any pills and Eddie lies and he says no. Then the New York Post publishes that article about him doing his day trading But it's not written in a very nice way because Eddie told the journalist off and he didn't want to do the interview. But Melissa sees it and she realizes that Eddie is on MDT because how else could he be making all this money in stock? And so she calls him up and they meet. In the movie, they mention the New York Post article in a positive way. So apparently it doesn't say anything negative about him. So he seems to just be eating up the attention in the movie and is fine doing an interview. Also in the movie, he gets back with Lindy when he like turns his life around on MDT. Then when he tries to slow down the MDT, he's withdrawing and he goes to her office and he asks her if she can go get it for him. And on her way back to the office, she calls saying she's being followed and the guy starts chasing her and he has her trapped. And so Eddie tells Lindy to take one of the pills and it'll help her. Also in the book, it says the pill takes like 20 minutes to kick in, but in the movie, it appears to be instant. Anyway, she takes it and she's able to save herself and she gets back to the office and puts one in his mouth as he's like passing out. And then we're shown the next day and Eddie is saying like how far the two of them can go on MDT and she says that she doesn't want to be part of it. And he's like, you know, like, what's the big deal? I'm still myself when I'm on it. And she says, really? I wasn't myself when I was on it. I did things I would never do. And they once again break up. And I really like that part. Substances hit people differently. And while Eddie may love being on MDT, it doesn't mean anyone who takes it would love it. And the fact that he truly isn't himself, he's an altered version, whether he acknowledges it or not. In the book, as I said, he doesn't have a girlfriend, just Ginny, who he has a crush on, and she never does MDT. So with this potential murder that happens, in the book and movie, there is this whole part where he has a night out and he blacks out for a large part of it and only remember bits and pieces. And in the book, he remembers hanging out with a Hispanic artist and his wife named Donatella. And in his fragmented memory, he remembers like being in a hotel with her, but nothing specific. And then the next day at lunch, he's with Carl waiting for Hank Atwood when he overhears two guys talking about Donatella being attacked and how she's now in a coma. And they say that the main suspect is some guy who was seen leaving the hotel with a limp. And Eddie, of course, when he came to that morning, he had a limp. And later in the news, he sees that they're looking for a man named Thomas Cole. And that is the name Eddie had given the prior night. He had given a fake name, so it it was lucky for him. And then Donatella eventually dies in the hospital. And so it's turned into a full-on murder investigation. And so later, things with the merger are on track. And Van Loon says that they will hold a press conference and announce the merger. And Eddie sees that the conference is going to take place in the same hotel Donatella was murdered. So for the next 24 hours, Eddie is like really worried and distracted. When he gets to the hotel, he goes upstairs to see if he really had been there. And he recognizes the hallway and he knows like, yes, I was here. He also had visions and dreams about what happened. And in one, he gets upset at something she says about America. And so he hits her in the head with a vase or something. And we don't know if this is what happened because they're just like dreams he has. So we don't know if it's his imagination or if it's an actual memory. Anyway, so the merger is broadcast on TV. And there's a moment when the camera pans the whole group and Eddie can be seen. And then later, the news shows this clip and they say that he has been identified as Thomas Cole, but that his real name is Eddie Spinola and that they're looking for him in regard to this murder. And later, he's also connected to the murder of the Russian guy who's found in his apartment. And he sees all this news when he's like in upstate New York in a hotel watching TV. We never do find out, like without a doubt, if he killed Donatella, but I think it seems like he may have most likely. And in the movie, he's in a meeting with Carl and he sees the face of a woman he had seen the night before on TV, then that she died. And he hires a top-notch lawyer and he gets away scot-free, like no big deal. And he doesn't even seem to be bothered by the fact that he may have killed someone. And in the end, he also kills the Russian guy, which by the way, in the book, he doesn't drink the blood of the Russian guy in order to get MDT, nor does the Russian guy inject MDT. He's just taking it in pill form. But anyway, so in the movie, he kills him as well. But the voiceover says that his apartment had previously been owned by an arms dealer. And so the whole murder with the Russian guy is pinned on that previous owner. And Eddie isn't in trouble for it at all, 
which is annoying. But this does beg the question, in the book, why didn't Eddie hire a lawyer in relation to the Donatella murder? Like, this was happening before he actually got any money, but still, he was able to get a condo because of a loan from Van Loon. Yeah, I don't know. It seems like he could have gotten a really good lawyer and probably have been fine, like he did in the movie. And speaking of his condo, in the book, he goes there and he looks at it, and he's on MDT, and the first time he's there checking it out, and he hears that it's $9 million, and he starts to have a panic attack because he's dealing with these numbers that he never could have imagined, and he's just feeling really overwhelmed. And I like this touch because I think it would be an overwhelming feeling, whereas in the movie, he just seems unfazed, like, or maybe he just adjusted instantly to these high numbers and fancy living, like... There's never a moment where he seems overwhelmed at the numbers he's dealing with. Uh, And then with Carl Van Loon. So in the movie and book, Eddie plays this integral part in the merger with Van Loon. And despite Eddie's erratic behavior, Carl sticks with him because when he's around, he's obviously on top of everything. And there's a meeting in the movie where he is on MDT and he tells Carl that he'd had a fever. Whereas in the book, Carl never sees Eddie off MDT. But he does leave the meeting after he hears the men talking about Donatella. And so the excuse he gives Carl is that he had to leave because he has a stomach condition and he was in the hospital. And he tells Carl that the reason he's been acting so erratic is that he was also on a new medication for his stomach and he was adjusting to it or something. And in the book, though, the day after the merger is when Eddie's name is released in connection with the two murders, Donatella and the Russian guy. And because of this, the merger is canceled and... Van Loon stock takes a nosedive. This is another thing Eddie sees while he's in his hotel room. In the movie, however, the merger goes off without a hitch. And as they're planning the merger, there's a part where Carl says he hopes Eddie doesn't just ditch him when all this is done. And Eddie says, like, well, I have to move on in order to learn and grow. And Carl says that you would even think that would only show me how unprepared you are to be on your own. I mean, you do know you're a freak. Your deductive powers are a gift from God or chance or whoever wrote your life script. A gift, not earned. You do not know what I know because you have not earned those powers. You're careless with those powers. You flaunt them and you throw them around like a brat with his trust fund. You haven't had to climb up all the greasy little rungs. You haven't been bored blind at the fundraisers. You haven't done the time in that first marriage to the girl with the right father. You think you can leap, leap over all that in a single bound. You haven't had to bribe or charm or threat your way to a seat at the table. You don't know how to assess your competition because you haven't competed. Don't make me your competition. And I like this part because it kind of does put Eddie in his place. Although, of course, it doesn't stick. And in the end, Eddie pays a guy in a lab to create more MDT. And his own stash is stolen by Hank Atwood's attorney because Atwood himself was on MDT. And he now doesn't have any due to Vernon's death. And so the lawyer steals it from Eddie, but then the lawyer keeps it for himself. But then Eddie gets it from the lawyer. But in the book, Hank Atwood was not on MDT. But in the end, he, it like, flash forwards a year, and he's running for Senate, and Carl visits him. Carl had bought out a pharmaceutical company, and he tells Eddie that he knows he's on MDT, and so he's blackmailing him because he had shut down Eddie's lab, and he says if Eddie wants more, he will have to be in Carl's back pocket, essentially. Eddie then reveals that he is actually off MDT, and that the last year they've been tweaking it, and they got to a point where he was able to just make these permanent changes to his brain I guess and no longer needs the MDT Uh, and then he like kind of threatens Carl and leaves it at that and then he goes to lunch where he meets Lindy so apparently she's not bothered about MDT anymore because she's back with him although I guess if he genuinely is off of it then that's why she's back with him but I still wish they would have explained that a bit more but obviously this ending here where Carl is Eddie's competition like he was just saying don't make me your competition But here, they are competitors in some way, and Eddie, of course, beats him. But with the book ending, after the merger, Eddie goes back to his apartment, and he sees someone has gone through all of his things, and they found MDT and had taken it. And he then gets a phone call. Before we get to the phone call, though, I should also explain that Eddie had been calling various people in Vernon's Black Book. Most people were sick or dead, but he does talk and meet up with this other guy who had taken it but stopped. And this is the guy that told him about the allergy medicine. He then finds Vernon's associate who made the drug. However, the guy was killed in a hit and run and his lab was shut down. And Eddie later realizes there's a connection with this Boston-based pharmaceutical company that Vernon had been keeping track of. And so he gets in contact with some guy about that. 
And so when the phone rings after his MDT is stolen, it's someone from that company. And they say they went too far. They say that Eddie went too far getting in contact with this guy who has something to do with the company. And so they had to put an end to it. And they took the MDT and now Eddie will have to withdraw and eventually die. And they talk about how it was really useful watching him because no one had done this much MDT before and no one had gone as far as he had. They then hang up on Eddie, but he's convinced that he can bribe them. So he gets $500,000 and he waits till morning, but they still don't call him back. And during the night, stuff with the Russian guy happens where he comes over and Eddie ends up killing him. And the Russian guy had five MDT pills on him. And so Eddie takes those pills. He then drives upstate and stops at Melissa's house. He puts a note on the briefcase and he gives it to her. The briefcase that it has the 500000 He doesn't talk directly to her, though, because her daughter answers the door. So he talks to the daughter and gives her the money. And then he goes to the hotel room, types up the story which we have been reading, and then it ends. And we assume that he must have died because he didn't have any more MDT. And so they actually turned the movie also into a TV show in 2015. It has a similar premise where it's this deadbeat that gets the drug and it changes his life. And I guess he does good with it, though, because he helps the FBI solve crimes. And Bradley Cooper has a reoccurring character as the U.S. Senator, Edward Mora, who provides the main character with a shot that helps counteract the negative side effects of MDT. And the show only had one season, so it must not have been that great. However, it does have a decent rating on IMDb. I personally haven't watched it yet, though. So the book or the movie, to be perfectly honest, I hate the movie ending. (laughs) Because Eddie, he has no remorse. And he seems to get everything he's ever wanted. He's in politics. He gets Lindy back, which they really should have done some explaining there because I liked that Lindy didn't want to be part of his MDT world. And yet she is. So I wish they would have explained that. In the book, actually, after a business dinner, Eddie is contemplating the future and he decides that he's going to get into politics. This, of course, doesn't happen for him in the book, but it does in the movie. And I like that in the book, Eddie makes up for the things he's done. And he gives the money he has to Melissa, who is a struggling single mother who's dealing with her post-MDT life. And it also seems really fitting that he apparently dies. Now, I enjoy a book where all things end well just as much as the next person. Well, maybe not quite as much as the next person. But I do enjoy it when things work out for the characters. But the movie, everything is just tied up so neatly, like too neatly, and everything works out too well for him. And I know it's not like he never worked for anything in his life like he did pay his dues to some extent as De Niro's character said though he hasn't had to climb up the ladder and deal with the nitty-gritty of getting into business in the political world and it's not like he's even doing that much work anyway because on MDT like things come easy so when it comes down to it I don't like the ending because it just doesn't seem fair (laughs) but maybe that's a fitting end because a lot of people get things handed to them when they don't deserve it and it's not fair And they don't make up for the wrongs they've done. And as Eddie says, there's in the movie, he says there's very little in life that $40 million won't fix. And sadly, this is true in business and in government, politics. If you've got plenty of money, then you can basically get away with whatever. Having said all that about the movie, it is very entertaining and it is well done. And as I said, I've seen it multiple times and I'm sure I'll watch it again in the future. The book was satisfying, though, because Eddie is remorseful and he is trying to right his wrongs. And I also kind of like books and movies with not so happy endings. Yeah, it just seems fair that he wasn't able to get away with all he hoped to. And part of you feels bad for him. But maybe that's also why I liked the end, because there's a part of you that has started to like him and it makes his death all the more tragic. Ultimately, I don't intend on reading the book again. But as I said, I'm sure I'll watch the movie. But... Yeah, I just really hate the movie ending, but I like the book ending, so it's a tough call. I guess if you've read this blog, then I would say to just stick to the movie and probably skip the book because I've told you how the book ends, and that's really the biggest difference. Uh, I mean, like I said, Lindy wasn't part of the book at all, so that's a big difference too, but just the fact that things don't work out and he dies at the end of the book is the biggest change. But now that you're already aware of that change... You could just go into the movie watching it, just keeping that in mind, I guess. But if you do choose to read the book, it certainly wouldn't be a waste of time because it was entertaining and I did enjoy it. So thanks for listening to today's podcast. Join me next week for What is Eating Gilbert Grape. Grape.
Thanks for listening. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, head over to my site, whythebookwins.com. You can leave a comment there and I will be sure to reply. You can also find me on Instagram under the same name, whythebookwins. And you can message me there and don't forget to follow. And also don't forget to subscribe to my podcast and join me next Wednesday for the newest episode of Why the Book Wins. Why the Book Wins.